Good morning. morning. It is so good to see you all. I want you to know that this morning I do have a temperature. Thank God that I do, otherwise I'd be dead. Uh, No, I'm safe. I'm good. Uh, But I always want to say that when I go into the doctor's office. I I just want to warn you I have a temperature. Well, they probably would spray me with Lysol and kick me out. So just kidding. Um, I want uh, you all to know that uh, Friday evening, one of our own, Charlotte Hubbard, passed into the Lord's presence. Um, she, her health has been declining for some time, and so she now worships in heaven where we all long to be. She's now together with uh, her husband, John, whom she affectionately called Hub. So be in prayer for the family. We, do, uh, we will be planning a funeral uh, for here uh, if everything goes according to plan, uh, but those plans won't be made until this week. So please be in prayer for the family. If you would, please pray with me now. Father, we cry out to you. We live in a world that is getting more chaotic. And Lord, we don't fully understand. We know what we see, but we don't understand everything that is going on. And being people of faith, we look to you and we cry out to you. We cry for your presence in this world now. Lord, some folks are making us believe that whoever gets into the White House is going to change things. But Lord, we understand that the Savior does not ride on Air Force One. We cry out for good leadership, for godly leadership, for godly human leadership. But Lord, the truth is, I believe a lot of our problems don't lie within the White House. They are in the church house. Lord, you have placed us in a position of power that we fail to recognize. You have called us to be ambassadors for Christ in this world. And you have given us a hotline to heaven. We call that prayer. And you have given us the privilege for our voices to be heard by the Most High God who bows to no one, who is second to none, the God who reigns even today. And so, Lord, I ask that my brothers and sisters would hear what you have to say through me this morning. My confidence is not in my words, but they are in yours. And so, Lord, for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, whom you love very much, so much so that you sent your son to die for them, and he was buried and raised back up in three days, and he lives today at your right hand. Praise God. On his behalf, with him as our intercessor, we come to you, and we plead, hear us, O Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Earthquakes are shaking, hurricanes are destroying, tornadoes flattening, fires devouring, new deadly diseases are threatening and taking lives. Sounds like the evening news, doesn't it? But it's not. Actually, what I'm giving you is based on Jesus' answer to the question, explain to us what the end times will look like. What will the end of the age look like? His words are recorded, his answer is recorded in Matthew 24. And so what I've just told you is based on his words, not mine and not the news. I believe that what Jesus was talking about there was the tribulation. I don't believe we're there. But I do believe we're getting close. I also believe that there won't be a light switch that will be into the tribulation, although there'll be some dramatic changes, one of which I believe that it will be brought in by the rapture. We will be, as believers, caught up out of here. I believe that is what is going to bring the tribulation in. But world events are not going to change. I believe we're going to roll into it. 
I believe things are going to be changing as we go. I believe that's what we're seeing. So what in the world is going on? Is this the end? No, I don't believe this is the end, but I do believe we're getting close to the end. Am I predicting anything? No. I'm just predicting what the Bible says. But how do we respond? How should you respond as a believer in Jesus Christ? How should you respond during this time? That's what I want to answer for you. How we should respond during these chaotic times. Again, this is not the end, but we're getting close. Now, for me to explain to you what is going on, I need to back out a little bit and give you a bigger picture of what's going on. So please hang with me here. The first thing I want you to realize is that we didn't make this world, and it didn't happen by accident, did it? The house that you live in did not happen by accident. It didn't just one day crop up from a tree that used to be there, did it? It was planned, and it was put there, and it's your house. What I want you to realize is that God created the earth and the heavens. And in that sense, this is his house. The world is God's house. Now, if you come to my house, we have rules at my house. Now, when you come into our house, we may say, make yourself at home. I am not saying, make this your home. So if you start walking around in your underwear, we're going to ask you to leave. <laughs> if you start using foul language, we're going to say, ah, uh -uh, we don't do that here. You see, because it's my house, I have rules there. God's house, God has rules. And one of those rules is, and it's even a law, is that you reap what you sow. Now, we're not used to planting, and, and we're not an agricultural culture so much. But I want you to realize that what you plant is what you get, right? You all know that. If you plant a tomato seed, don't be looking for a grapefruit tree. You plant seeds. So God has set up the world, his world, his house, his rules. If you follow God, you get grace and peace if you follow his rules. That's what Jesus was talking about with the abundant life. He promised an abundant life, but it's conditional on following him. Because he not only made us, he wired us, and he knows what's best for us. So if we plant seeds of lies, well, the fruit of that is going to be confusion, distrust, skepticism, cynicism. If we plant seeds of violence, you're going to get more violence. If you plant seeds of greed, you're going to get corruption. We're seeing all that today, aren't we? Is this God's judgment? In a sense, it is. Now, if you want a good understanding of what's actually happening in the world and our country right now, there is an author that I have found. I think he really did a great job on explaining it. I've not seen a better explanation. So this is a little bit lengthy, not too long. But I want you to listen to this carefully because this is the best explanation I've heard of that we are experiencing now. God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate. As people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see eternal power. There's a God who created all this, right? That's what he's saying. For instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion 
so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all. Don't we see that today? But were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. So God said, in effect, that's what you want. That's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen, smeared with filth, filthy inside and out, and all this because they traded the truth of God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them. Isn't that good? The God we bless, the God who blesses us, oh, yes. Worse followed. Refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women, men with men, all lust, no love. And then they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love, godless and loveless wretches. Since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them. Did you hear that? Since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell broke loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious, backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, bickering and cheating. Look at them. Mean-spirited, venomous, fork-tongued, God-bashers, bullies, swaggers insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face. And they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. Now, some of you who are very astute recognize what I just did. I just read to you from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. The author I'm speaking about is the Apostle Paul, as he was guided by God, the Holy Spirit, to write these things down. So while we're sitting there thinking, who wrote this? Because this makes a lot of sense. It's what we're seeing. We are, spe- we are experiencing the wrath of God, folks. That's what we're seeing in our culture. I've explained this to you before, so forgive me for saying it again. But the way God judges our sin is with sin. Not that he sins, but that God says, Okay, if you really want that, then you got it. If you want to push me out of the culture, go ahead. Push me out of the culture. If you want your way, go ahead. The problem is, when God moves away, we don't get his protection. And that's what we're seeing. That's some of the natural disasters we're seeing. God could protect us, but we told him to get out. We've kicked them out of the courtroom. We've kicked them out of the classroom. We've kicked them out of many churches. You can speak of God in our culture today, but be careful. Don't mention Jesus Christ. Now you might be a radical, and we don't need any of that. And yet all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. We live in chaotic times because we've left the God of organization. Now, I know that you haven't, and I know that you all love God. You love the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to know this is what we're experiencing, and this is what we're living with in our culture today. Sounds kind of hopeless, doesn't it? We would say, you can't stay God's hand. What he's going to do, he's going to do. 
And while it is true, and we may say it's too late, I'm just going to give up and I'm going to bury my head in the sand and I'm going to run away and sequester myself in my own little Christian group. I really don't think that's what God is asking you to do. And he's not asking me to do it. He's asking us to cry out. If we don't, who will? I know society tells you all that, you know, if we're over 60 or whatever age they want to put on it, we are insignificant. Your old hat. If you don't know your iPhone inside and out, well, you just have no value. We talk about having stupid phones, not smartphones. That doesn't make you stupid. That doesn't make you insignificant. You, within you, is the Holy Spirit, folks. You've trusted in Christ. In you is the Holy Spirit of God crying out. And if we don't ask, who will? If we don't cry out to God and ask and pray for revival, who will? I remind you that just a short uh, cursory look through the book of Judges, you will see how God works many times. In the book of Judges, you see seven cycles where the people were worshiping God. They turned to idols and sin, and then condemnation came and corruption came, and things got so bad they cried out to God. And what did God say? I had enough of you. No, he rescued them. He'd raise up a judge, and he would work through that judge, and he would bring them back to him. Revival. We see it in the book of Jonah, where even a wicked people approached a holy God, and God heard, and God gave him revival. You see, you can't stay the hand of God, nor can I, but we can sway the hand of God. Who will cry out? Will you cry out? Will you go to him, Daddy, we need revival. Start with me. I want you to know that we've been here before. I've given you a few examples from the Bible, but I want you to know even as a country, we've been here before. When you get to the lowest ebb, that's when we tend to look up. When our face is in the dirt and we don't know what to do, we look up. And we've been here before. I want to remind you that our country was uh, first founded uh, when, they, when uh, pilgrims came upon these lands. And what were they doing? They were seeking to go to a land where the gospel could flow freely, where they could, re, uh, they could worship God without fear of persecution. But things started to digress through the 1600s into the early 1700s. And then many look at a pivotal message, although that didn't start it, but that was where a lot of historians look. On July 8, 1741, Jonathan Edwards, a, ser- a pastor and a theologian, delivered a sermon in Enfield, Connecticut that was called, and you've heard of it before, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Many historians look back and they say that was a pivotal pivotal moment in American history. That was the beginning of the Great Awakening. Through that time, many people came to Christ and God started working. He raised up men like John Wesley and George Whitfield and they went around and they preached, but none of these men brought the Great Awakening. God did. And it started with people like you and me praying, looking around and saying, God, I know what the problem is here. I know what everybody else is saying, and they're pointing fingers at everything. But I know we've left you. We need you. And if we come back to you, then we're going to be fine. And my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren will be fine. We're not giving up. We're pleading the blood of Jesus on this land again. Through that time, many things happened. New theological training schools. Princeton, Brown, Rutgers, Dartmouth. (laughs) They're not not schools today training clergy, are they? But that's how they got their start. And things started to digress again to the point to where maybe 5 to 10% of people were going to church in the 1800s. Down from 40 to 50% during 
that time of the Great Awakening. It was during that time that John Marshall wrote to a colleague of his. He was a chief uh, justice of the Supreme Court, and, he, and I say, uh, I quote, The church is too far gone ever to be redeemed. That's it. But it wasn't. People like you and me looked around and recognized, God, we need a revival. We need your spirit to move amongst us. It was during that time that folks were even saying that uh, the typical Harvard student was an atheist. And we look around today and we go, well, yeah. Harvard was started in 1636 as a school to train clergy. How far we've moved from that. But during this time in the 1800s and during the Second Great Awakening, there was five college students that got together and they said, you know, we need to do something about this. So what became known as the Haystack Prayer Meeting, today historians look back and they say that was the beginning of our modern missions movement. Five college students getting together and pleading to God to work through them. And he did in a mighty way. From there, we went to a third great awakening, the Layman's Revival in New York. And then there was a global revival in the 1900s. Uh, many say that it started the Pentecostal movement in 1906 on Azusa Street in California. But we've not experienced a worldwide revival since the 1900s. Don't you think it's time? The Jesus movement of the 1970s, were they reckless times, weren't they? Remember the sexual revolution of the 60s? And God decided he'd bring somebody like Billy Graham in to start preaching to people. You see, folks, we've been here before many times, and now it's our turn. It's your turn. What are we going to do about it? We're not going to storm Washington. But I want you to know that next weekend there are a group of Christians that are going to storm Washington, not to protest, but to pray. And they're calling out for prayers worldwide for revival. Now, I want to tell you that this will happen next Friday and Saturday. Uh, they're calling it the return. I want you to realize, I feel I, I need to tell you, that there are people involved with this group who have done some things that I think are a little reckless and presumptuous of the Bible. Okay? Um, pro prophesying. Uh, personally, I don't believe God prophesies anymore. He talks through this. I believe he speaks to you as a believer. I believe he speaks to me as a believer. I call that my conscience. A little careful with that because some people have a pretty seared conscience and they can justify a lot. But I believe the Holy Spirit of God works. I believe he speaks to us. But when it comes to prophecy and what's going to happen, it's here. And I don't see him telling any one man what he's going to do. Okay? You with me? So while this group is getting together, and there are people in that group that I would say, I think you've gone a little too far. We can agree with the premise and the reason they're getting together. Revival. Revival. God, come. We want you to be first again. There's several things God cannot do. God can't lie. You know that, right? God cannot deny himself. But there's something else that you may or may not be thinking of. God cannot be second. He must be first. And when we try to make him second, God steps away and said, well, let's see how that works out for you. You want that? You got it. You want to be God? Go ahead. You want to do what you want to do? Go ahead. And this is where it's led us. It's time. Compassionately, lovingly we need to pray i truly believe we we live in the greatest country in the world i believe that god has blessed us tremendously i believe that we are people of great privilege and i want that for my kids and my grandkids should the lord tarry but each time we've reached our lowest god we've reached out to god and he's reached down and he's brought us a revival and it starts with us it starts with you. It starts with me. I pray daily that God would revive you and revive me. That I would recognize where I've made him second. 
I don't know of any place I've made him second. And I'm not saying that you can't have a life, but I am saying that he must be first. He must be Lord over all because he is Lord over all. I want you to see a cry for revival in Psalm 85. If you would, turn there. I'm going to give it more of a cursory look this morning. But in Psalm 85, we see the psalmist looking back and looking up. Looking back and saying, God, you've done great things in the past and we need you to do it again. Now, we don't know when Psalm 85 was written. There are some scholars who believe that this was written after Israel was released from Babylon and they were coming back into the land. They had gone through a period of severe judgment where they had slipped into idolatry time and time and time and time and time again. And God finally said, enough. You want idolatry? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let you go to the most idolatry, uh, idolatrous country in the world. And I'm going to have the king personally come and pick you up. And he did. He raised Jerusalem and he took the people, killed, slaughtered many of them. And those who survived, they drug them back to Babylon. If you want idolatry, you got it. Folks, we don't want what we're asking for. And what we think we want won't get us where we want to be. Look at the words of the psalmist. Psalm 85. Verse 1, O Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob, the Jews, the Jewish people. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You forgave us. You've been faithful in the past, O God. You covered all their sin. Selah. We don't know exactly what that means. I think one of the things it means is stop. And let that truth sink in for a moment. Let the wonder in. You withdrew your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. God, you've been merciful to us in the past. You have blessed us in the past. Can we not say that in our country? Oh, God, look how you have blessed this country. Look how you have blessed us and provided for us. Verse 4. Restore us, O oh God, our salvation. Not promises, not saying we'll get our armies together, we'll get our act together, we'll do. No, we're crying out to you, God. We're crying out to you. Restore us, O oh God, of our salvation. You're the only one who can. And cause your indignation toward us to cease. Please don't be angry with us anymore. We're going to repent. Will you be angry with us forever? Oh, I hope not. Why would God be angry with them? Because they rejected him. Because they turned away from him. One of the greatest sins in the Bible is idolatry. You want to see God's anger? You want to see his wrath? Go into idolatry. Well, I know none of you have figurines on your dashboards or on your mantles at home. We've gotten quite sophisticated with our idols. Our idols are more like movie stars and sports stars and money and wealth and materialism and stuff. Our, ours is more like games and, and education and degrees and jobs and positions and, dare I say, golf. Yeah, I just lost some of you there, didn't I? God wants you to enjoy life, and he wants you to enjoy all of those things. But he wants to be first, because he must be first. And if you don't have him as first, that's the worst thing you can do for you. And so God wants to be first. He wants you to enjoy what you have and what he's allowed you to have. He wants you to enjoy your kids, your family, your job, your position, your education, your house, your golf game, and all of that. But he must be first. He must be first. Verse 6. Will you not yourself revive us again? I would like for you to pray that this week every day. Please revive us, God. That your people may rejoice in you. 
God, you revive us and we're going to rejoice in you. I have found that God is desperate, not desperate, but passionate about his glory. And so when I ask God for something, I tell him what he gets out of it. You give me a healthy body, God, and I'm going to give you a healthy body to tell people about you, to worship you, to be an example. And so I always tell God, I've learned to. This is what you get, God. See, I'm just convinced he's not trying to make my life miserable. He's not trying to hammer me. He's not trying to find me having fun and kill it. He's saying, Keith, I have everything planned out for you. If you really want to enjoy life, I have that all worked out. I made you. I wired you. I know exactly what, where you're going to be your happiest and best. Just follow me. It's the same for you. It's the same for, that's the God you worship. And so, verse 7, show us your loving kindness. I love that word. Hebrew behind that word is chesed. Chesed. God identifies himself as this is what he abounds in, loving kindness. And grant us your salvation. That's the cry of our hearts. That's the cry of our hearts. Revive us, O Lord. Revive us. Don't save them. Revive us and let us reach them. Work through us. But we tend to think with revival and awakening, boy, those people out there sure do need it, man. Look at the mess they are. And God's saying, but I want to use you. Where are you? Are you with me? And so here's what I'd like you to do. I want to ask you a couple questions. Believer, have you drifted? Has church become something that you do when you have time? Is God someone that you spend time with when you have time? How do you show him on a daily basis that he's important? Is he part of your daily life? Do you spend some time in his word? Do you expect to get something out of it? Do you pray and meditate on his word? Has entertainment, TV, games, reading, golf, tennis, have they taken first place? That happens to us all if we're not careful. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you saw God do something in your life personally for you? How far back, how far back do you have to go? A day? A week? A month? Years? My challenge for you is to spend some time with God alone. I'm asking you to fast from something this week. Take a day, take a night, take a morning. You may say, I can't fast from food because it, it'll create problems with the medicines I take. That's okay. Uh, maybe pick a night. Fast from TV. Tonight the TV's not going on. I'm going to pray. And it's not just fasting from something. It's fasting from something to do something. God, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to read your word tonight before I go to bed. TV's not going on. Or maybe the morning. I'm not going to turn it on, God, or I'm going to do something else. Or maybe you're going to give something else up so you can make some dedicated time. Maybe you have the ability to do that once this week. Maybe you can do it every day this week. I leave that to you. But if you want God to show up in your life, you have to show up in his. He's not going to chase you down. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to be wasting your time. The first thing you need to do is you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, God made it very clear that he loved the world so much, you, that he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes. And guys like me sometimes want to put a lot of stuff on that. Well, you're going to have to, if you're going to get salvation, you're going to have to do these works. And here's the long list of do's. And here's a longer list of don'ts. And yet that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it very clearly, that whoever believes, whoever trusts in Christ is the only way to heaven, that's the person God gives eternal life to. Ah, uh, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. God does, and he still made that offer. You see, you need to trust in Christ first. Now you're into a relationship with God. And now the Holy Spirit is working in you, and you can cry out and be heard by the God of the universe. 
So my challenge for you this week is take time. Let God scour your heart. Are there some sins in your past? When was the last time you had a little time of confession with God? Just tell him. God, you know, I've had this attitude. I've had this. I've had... Tell him. Confess to him. God, I'm going to move away from that. And you know and he knows you're going to fall into some of those things again. It's okay. Keep the right spirit. Keep working. You see... We're in election season again. We think the White House needs to get right, but I remind you, the church house needs to get right. That's where the power is. It's in the church house. And you have power, and you need to go to your father this week and next week. Listen to Romans 13, 11, And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Brothers and sisters, God loves you. God wants to spend time with you. If he's not number one, make him number one. Let's see what he does. Let's pray. Father, I pray that the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouths will be pleasing to you, for you are good. We cry out to you, revive us, O Lord. Show us your loving kindness. Grant us your salvation. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us. Those who stand against us, those who want to disrupt, those who want to hurt, those who want to undermine, frustrate them. Revive us, O Lord. Revive us. In Jesus' name, amen.